week, which is about equitable and sustainable cities. Uh, as you will see in uh, the talk, uh, Usman, um, who is the creative director uh, and founding partner of Umbrellium, um, designing and builds urban technologies that support citizens' empowerment and high impact engagement in cities. So uh, Usman works with urban experiences, we may say. Uh, Usman is also a um, founding partner of Thinkful, um, which is a search engine for the Internet of Things. Um, so you will uh, discover um, in a bit the projects and the researches uh, done by Usman, who's uh, with us from the other side of the world, um, from Singapore. Hello, Usman. Um, Ciao. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. How are you doing? We are, we are fine. Thank you. Are you in Singapore, right? I am in Singapore. I'm here uh, temporarily. I should be uh, finally back to London in about two weeks. I've been here now six months, but uh, uh, hoping to get home in two weeks. Okay. Thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure always to have you. I would like to um, welcome also uh, all the, the audience and the people who are attending. Um, I'm very glad to have a uh, very, good, very good number of uh, attendees and uh, I would like to also thank you, the students who are now connected uh, together with me and Usman as panelists, because they will join the session uh, after Usman's presentation. Um, in a Q&A session, so they will share their thoughts and um, questions with Usman. So I would say that we, we, we have first uh, a presentation by Usman about his uh, works, uh, and then we move on into this uh, Q&A by, um, done with, uh, with the students from uh, Domus Academy. Um, thank you, uh, Usman, again, you feel free to start whenever you want. I will be here. Um, thank you again for, um, for all the audience for being with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, I would like to uh, just uh, share my screen here. Um, let me... Start. Here we go. So um, I want to talk today about uh, infrastructures for participation. Um, the topic is uh, is something that has been kind of key to my work over the last ten or fifteen years, um, which is really how to get people involved in the design and creation of their own environments, their neighborhoods, their cities, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm trained as an architect. And so today I'm gonna to be presenting a particular perspective on architecture, on technology, on cities, uh, and more specifically on participation and, the, and what I call the infrastructures of participation. I'm gonna get a little deeper into that later, but essentially when I'm talking about the infrastructures of participation, I'm talking about all the different ways that we can structure the way that people are able to collaborate with each other to do something or to achieve something. Now, um, you, there's actually been quite a lot of work done on what's, what are known as the structures of participation. The reason I talk about the infrastructures is because I'm actually interested almost at a, at, at, a, at a level below the structures, which is how to create the platforms that enable a variety of structures, uh, if you like, of participation. And I use this analogy partly because uh, uh, I think of my, my background in architecture, but also because I think that even in, I, I think the, the one of the really interesting things that you understand through the discipline of architecture, that even something that seems to have no structure actually is itself a form of structure. And so whenever you're talking about participatory systems, um, the question of things like the dynamics of power, the dynamics of governance and decision-making all become uh, very important. I'm actually gonna just start with 
uh, an image that kind of got me started in this kind of work about 20, 20, no, 20, I think 26 years ago was when I first saw this image, which uh, was a, from a book called The Climatic Physiology of the Pig. Now, these are the same piglets in the same box, but on the right hand side, the temperature has been increased by just a few degrees. And what was so interesting about this image was that from an architectural perspective, it really expressed how just by a small change in the software of space or the program of space, changing the temperature, you can dramatically alter the experience that the occupants have within that space, the experience to each other, to the environment around them and so on and so forth. And it kind of led me to start thinking about architecture, uh, not just as walls and roof and ceiling and floor and so on and so forth, but also temperature and sound and lights and electromagnetic fields and even sort of social relationships. Um, and more specifically, it kind of got me thinking from the perspective of, of architecture, there are sort of three fundamental aspects that I think that even now uh, I still continue to, to, to sort of uh, approach architecture. The first is this idea that, that for me, that in architecture, it, it is not architecture until there is a process of perception and interaction. The actual, uh, the, the difference between the physical structure and the experience is, if you like, um, manifested by some kind of embodiment in the experience of space and in the experience of people to each other. And without that, you know, architecture really is just static sculpture. Buildings in and of themselves to me are not exactly architecture. The second thing uh, about architecture that kind of really drove home to me was this idea that we should, or rather I, I wanted to fo uh, focus on building for now and, and the near term future. Um, and this is because I think there is, of course, a, a branch of architecture that is all about speculation and it is about the future. But I'm most interested myself in how do we do everything that's incredibly complex right now so that we can collectively figure out that future. I think one of the one of the sort of challenges in the architecture profession that we are confronted with in the 21st century is that historically, typically the architect has had to own and control the vision of the future. And that has not worked. You know, we have to find a new paradigm uh, for uh, imagining, deciding on, and then creating the, the future. And for me anyway, it, it, it has to be built on what we are doing right now. Um, the third thing is this idea that technology is not in any sense neutral. It is a sort of a socio-political framework and architecture is uh, a socio-political framework made solid, uh, if you like. Now, again, there's a lot of work uh, and, and other, uh, uh, other people that you can uh, dive into to, uh, to look more closely at this relationship between technology and society. But essentially what it meant for me was that whenever I'm working with technology, I am trying to remember that there is a political process uh, uh, that I'm going through. And by political, I ultimately mean power, right? Um, because the discipline of architecture has historically been very much about this question of who has power, who is deciding, who is defining, who is actually um, determining what a city looks like, what a building looks like, how people occupy the buildings, what they're allowed to do there, where they're allowed to do it, when they're allowed to do it. And historically, the power dynamic has been um, in the architecture profession, it has been male dominated and it has been dominated by the individual kind of making that uh, uh, set of decisions on behalf of others. What we are seeing now, however, is that there is a vision of power in the city that can be much more dispersed, there, that can be much more uh, about a diversity of sometimes even conflicting ideas uh, of, um, of power and, and what it's used for. And what I find quite interesting is that this is a, 
uh, a challenge that actually faces designers in general, because particularly if you're interested in in participatory, excuse me, participatory uh, systems as I am, you're ultimately grappling with this question of how do I remove the power that I have as a designer and distribute it more evenly, um, uh, or 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 how can I actually be part of a system where actually I have almost uh, a, a desire to reduce power. Um, and there's a variety of ways that, that, that I think we can do that, which I'll come to uh, in a bit. Now, often this kind of conjunction of technology in cities and uh, uh, technology and um, uh, power and people f ends up kind of in a debate about the smart city and kind of using technology to create the, uh, as this marketing slide shows, the uh, building tomorrow's cities. The, the issue is, and I think this is quite, has been quite well debated um, uh, recently, is that of course cities are not problems to be solved, but technology is sold as a solution to a problem. And when technology is applied to a city as if it were a problem, Actually, it's like taking a hammer to a multi-dimensional game of chess. You know, the city is such a complex organism that a blunt instrument like technology, in the absence of much more um, sophisticated implementation of things like participation and governance, uh, is is pretty much doomed to fail. And also, if you look at the kind of paradigm of the smart city as it's uh, as it kind of it manifests itself in terms of um, uh, the, the surveillance and security mechanisms. This is also what the smart city is about, right? It's about uh, dynamics of power and control. Uh, it's about um, uh, data, uh, personal data that's actually uh, accessible by uh, other organisms, uh, organizations unknown to you. It's about leaks, leaking data, all of this is the smart city. It's, it's car companies uh, faking their environmental um, data. It's about auto, autonomous vehicle uh, testing on, on the streets um, before actually um, uh, finishing a project, uh, a product. It's about, you know, uh, a, a teenager being able to hack uh, into systems uh, and, and take them over. All of this is as much a part of the, the the smart city paradigm as the marketing spiel about sort of making happier, healthier cities and so on and so forth. Um, I I quite so this is actually a video from a demonstration. Uh, it's a few years old now, but it's a demonstration of a self-driving vehicle that's supposed to be demonstrating how it parks. Um, and uh, what's interesting is if just watch the people who are watching this demonstration. So uh, they trusted the algorithms inside this car so explicitly that they didn't even jump out of the way when the car uh, accelerated towards them. And it was later explained that the reason that this uh, uh, accident happened was because um, a certain module had not been activated uh, in, in the car. This is as much a part of the smart city uh, as, as, as the dream. And one of the problems with this kind of approach, uh, a technology-driven approach to, to trying to sol solve the city, is that we've actually seen this happen uh, uh, time and time again. So this is an image of pruitt Igo. Uh, in the 1960s, in um, th this was a, a new urban development uh, near near the west uh, side of the U.S. And when it was presented, it was marketed along the lines of being uh, a safe and secure and convenient and optimized environment, using exactly the same language that's being used today to to sell um, uh, technology systems for the city. And barely 10 years later, that development was um, knocked down because it was a bit of a disaster. And although some people think it was the fault of the, the physical structures, the buildings, 
in actual fact, it was a failure across everything from the uh, from the diversity of perspectives of all the different people that had to move into uh, uh, into the into this um, uh, uh, development whose whose views were not taken into account. Um, it was a failure of governance. It was a failure of social programs, and it was a failure of all the things that are actually important when designing and and making decisions about urban environments. And so it's because of this that whenever I'm talking about the kind of technological project that, 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 I, that, I, that I tend to get involved in, the participatory framework is actually the more important aspect of it, if you see what I mean. Actually figuring out how to, um, how to, how to involve people uh, in a process is not just something that's kind of nice and cute to have. It's actually in order to fundamentally drive the, uh, the, the, the project itself and ensure that it doesn't fail. So if I'm going to talk about the infrastructures of participation, there's really three key things that I think I've picked up over the years that at least for me have kind of driven the way I've tried to, to kind of um, uh, uh, determine these, these kind of uh, uh, infrastructures, if you like. The very ba the, the most basic one is when I'm, when I'm working on a project, I'm trying to think about how can I increase the number of decisions that other people make? In other words, rather than being the kind of the controller of all decisions at this kind of center of a project, um, which is typically the role of a creative director. Actually, how can you involve more and more people in more and more decisions? And the reason I say number of decisions uh, it, is that actually what I've noticed over the years is that even if the decisions are small, even if the decisions seem trivial, uh, that somebody else is making, that some that that a member of a of a of a local neighborhood or a local community is making, uh, even if they seem like sort of small or trivial decisions, actually by having more of a say at more opportunities and having more opportunities to kind of present their perspective, it it it, it means that they're more invested in the process of the project itself, and. This is, this is something I'd like to contrast to the way that um, uh, typically uh, an architect getting involved in, in community-led design might, might work where they will do a design and then they will ask the community for feedback and you'll sit down around a table and people kind of offer their opinions and so on and so forth. But all they're really doing is feeding back on a design that already exists. So they have one, uh, you know, they, they, they basically have one big decision, but in order to satisfy all of their, uh, all of their criteria, you end up having to chop down the, the scope and ambition of that project. And what I'm suggesting instead is actually that if you involve people throughout the entire process, it, deciding on small parts of it, actually, by the time you all sit down, uh, everyone has has kind of already been able to see where their particular input came into a project, rather than just having to decide at the end. The second thing is this idea of ensuring that you're 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 through the process of participating, building a shared memory uh, of of a possible future. So as a designer, rather than determining the outcome and then trying to convince people to join it, instead flipping it so that you're designing uh, um, uh, a platform or a framework or even just a situation or an event uh, where people can come together to make their own decisions together about what the future might look like or what that, um, uh, or what that, uh, uh, or, or, or to experience something together in order to critique whether it is what one needs uh, for the future. So it's about their 
uh, experience of of the of the sort of the, the near future. The third thing is, um, and this is the final one, uh, is figuring out ways to connect people together so that they're doing stuff together, they're making decisions together that in some way exceed their expectations for what they would have otherwise done on their own. And essentially what this means is that when people are working together and accomplishing something together, what I've noticed is it leads more often to people feeling responsible for the outcome. You know, they're actually, um, uh, if you like, collectively part of determining something and through their connections with other people, they're able to have more of an impact than they would have had on their own. So I'm often trying to think about how to it, it really just connect people together so that they can do stuff. Um, uh, it, for example, uh, uh, making decisions together about something. So what I want to do is I just want to go through these three things and in each case, um, illustrate uh, a project uh, to kind of discuss uh, what, what this means. So the first one is increase the number of decisions. So I'm going to talk about a project called Cinder, which um, uh, is situated uh, in Cambridge in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's actually on, on the outskirts of the city of Cambridge. We were invited uh, to come and work with what would be a new uh, a new community, a new urban development. Um, uh, and there was going to be a, a new school called Trumpington Community Co College. And we were asked to work to do a project for the school. And in fact, there wasn't really much of a brief when we first got involved, but we were told that the school was going to be filled with high tech and high sustainability systems, lots of sensors, energy monitoring, and so on and so forth. And we were also told that there would be that the that the challenge for us really was to make the incoming students feel like the building, the school itself was was theirs, you know, because they, they were a new community to feel like that school was actually their resource, their building, their kind of um, uh, uh, community space, if you like. And this building was planned to have quite an innovative um, classroom set up and to be um, uh, essentially very much focused on things like science and technology uh, and so on and so forth. So we worked uh, with the students that, um, that would be coming into the school for about two years uh, before the building was even open. So we worked in different schools around, the, um, uh, 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 around Cambridge from the Federation uh, that would be ultimately uh, moving uh, into the school when it was open. And for two years, we did a series of workshops with them, trying to understand, you know, what would make this school feel like theirs. And one of the themes that emerged quite early on was the idea of having a school pet or a school mascot. And so the students uh, would each kind of discuss what this pet or mascot might look like, what it might do, how it might behave. Um, and they would present to each other and to us, and we'd discuss and debate um, uh, how, how it might manifest itself um, in the school. Um, as I said, this, this kind of went on for, for a couple of years, doing these kind of workshops. Um, what soon emerged was the idea that, that a cat would be a, a good pet to have. We started building kind of prototypes of, of a kind of an interactive cat that, that could roam around the, the school with all sorts of behaviors. Basically, they were interested to have it connected to the sensor systems uh, and responding to the environment and to the energy use and changing its behavior and color and um, uh, size and all these sorts of things. And so we did a series of prototypes in response to, to that work that uh, effectively uh, a couple of years later turned into um, uh, an augmented reality uh, interface in the school where this cat pr prowls around interacting with people but also responding to the environment, getting bigger, changing color, disappearing, playing with people. Um, and the students can kind of read the environment of the building through the cat. But every now and then the cat disappears into the network, gets bored or hungry. 
and appears on one student's laptop. And the, 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 the student whose laptop it appears on has to decide how much to feed Cinder. And the amount of food that's available is based on how much energy has been generated by the solar panels. So they're having to make a decision about the resource allocation on the basis of their understanding of the environment, of the energy usage of the, the building itself. And Cinder is a cat that they themselves that have actually created to manifest um, their experience uh, of the building. Um, and so this was done as a, a, a permanent uh, um, part of the building fabric. The data model is designed actually to last at least 20 years as technology evolves, new types of um, uh, visualization can, can, can use it. Um, but essentially, it's, if you like, it's almost like a replacement for uh, what, what, is, uh, what is typically a building management system with a bar graph. Uh, and here it's the building actually uh, ex uh, exemplifying uh, people's experience with, with the environment. And it's designed according to some of the things that the students planned to actually evolve over time. And there are lots of sort of Easter eggs that are built into it so that five years from now, um, certain things are gonna happen that the students who, who were there at the time uh, will probably be uh, uh, off to university by that point. And uh, Cinder's actually gonna uh, uh, do, do some very different things at that point. So that was all about getting people involved in, in kind of decision-making um, uh, and, and being involved throughout the process of, of, of kind of really sort of defining um, uh, uh, what the outcome would be. Next, I want to show a project which illustrates this idea of building a shared memory of a possible future. So we had been thinking about um, for a while um, the challenge of pedestrian crossings in the 21st century. And they're challenged because the pedestrian crossing that, that we're used to, at least in Britain, uh, was originally designed about 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and as our streets start to get filled up with autonomous vehicles, which is what the self-driving car companies tell us, uh, eventually you will no longer need to have a crossing because you'll be able to cross anywhere and somehow sort of automatically the vehicles will will be able to move around you now that's fine but we're you know you know assuming it works it's still going to be at least another 20 years uh before that is uh, the case and in fact the next 20 years are therefore the most complex because people in the 21st century really respond to a crossing in a very different way than they might have 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, not just because their relationship to the street has changed, but even where they were painted may no longer be fit for, for, for their needs. And so we started working on this idea of, uh, of um, and we worked in South London uh, on this, the idea of a pedestrian crossing where actually it would learn what is the best possible configuration um, uh, on any, at any given time of day and be able to kind of evolve over time to respond to the way that people use that crossing. So in other words, rather than de designing the crossing to be kind of all about the vehicles, it was about designing a crossing that was all about people and how they use the space and how to make the, 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 the road more dynamic for people to use it themselves. And so, as I said, I think at the beginning uh, uh, of this talk, for me, it's important to actually build and not just speculate on what this might be for people who are actually um, uh, uh, potentially going, going to be use it. So we, um, we created this in South London. We actually built this street, which is uh, fully dynamic. We created a road surface that has um, uh, that is essentially it's a bit like a sort of an, uh, a, a computer screen, but it's um, it can take the weight of vehicles. Uh, it's waterproof, uh, and you can see it during the day. And we coupled it with 
uh, a camera vision system that actually can make sense of what is going on in the street. In other words, the vehicles, the cyclists, the pedestrians, how many there are, where they're crossing, uh, when there are danger conditions, and essentially create different types of pattern or output in order to, to kind of uh, adapt to the situation. So for example, if there's a lot more people crossing, for example, when, when school is finished for the day and lots of kids are trying to, to walk across the road, the crossing could actually get wider um, and uh, it could move from one end of the street to the other, uh, perhaps on the weekend when different people are using the space. Or um, if somebody runs in front of a vehicle, the road could actually uh, show some sort of uh, warning signals uh, for people. So once we did that, um, that was about uh, four years ago. Uh, we ended up about nine months, no, uh, actually about a year ago now, uh, spinning out a separate company called Starling, which is all focused on, on basically developing pedestrian safety systems in junctions and, and streets. And it's more about the kind of the, 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 the control mechanism than the output, because now there's actually a lot of output systems on roads, you know, there's all sorts of um, LED technology that, that can go into the road, into the pavement. There are signaling uh, systems, there are signs, interactive and all of these kind of things. And so the Starlink system is really designed to, to, to manage uh, all of those. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this idea of kind of connecting people together so that they can sort of um, take take ownership or responsibility for um, uh, for something, and so the project I want to talk about is called Voiceover, which we worked on with several communities around Britain, um, starting in 2016 up in the north of uh, of England uh, in um, uh, East Durham, which is um, it's. It's actually old kind of uh, former coal mining uh, territory. And one of the things that emerged very early on while we were working with them, and, and we kind of worked in a very similar way to the way we had worked in Cinder, which was that we, um, uh, we, we would talk about different things that the, the, the community saw in itself and what they might be looking for. Uh, and then we would kind of create prototypes over time to sort of try and um, uh, explore these ideas and build it up into a bigger and bigger and bigger uh, system. And one of the things that emerged quite early on was this idea of voice and, uh, and, and having a voice both with each other, but also um, uh, to the outside world and being able to connect with neighbors who, uh, who perhaps they didn't know. So people on their own street where, in the, you know, sort of 30, 40 years ago, people would say, oh, you know, I, I used to know everyone who lived on my street, but now, now I don't know anyone. Um, and so we, we started building a series of these systems where people could kind of use their voice to express something out in kind of physical space, basically converting their voice into this sort of light output. And what we ended up doing was basically connecting all of these together from house to house um, uh, uh, and having discussions about how these, um, these sort of installations would connect together, essentially to create a, a, a kind of a local, a hyper-local social radio where everyone could talk to other, uh, each other and they could actually use this radio framework um, uh, for, for, for whatever they determined it to be used for. In other words, they would kind of govern the system. Um, so the way it works is that everyone who's part of the project has a radio and, and it actually literally looks like a radio. Uh, it's the voiceover radio. And this is connected to a kind of a light antenna on the outside of their house. And so when they speak uh, to someone at the other end of the road, their, their message goes out of this light antenna, bounces down this, the road all the way to the other end, uh, and it goes in and out of each house. So it's a very public 
kind of communication system. This is not about a private system. This is about saying what happens when there is a system that's actually explicitly created to be public and to share uh, 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 public information. I say public, but, but it's actually a closed system. So it's only for people who have joined the, uh, the, the project. And participants could basically use this as an excuse to go to their neighbors and say, you know, you know would you like to be part of the system? Actually, we need to be able to send a message around the corner. So, you know, uh, would you be part of this as well? Or people who weren't yet part of it would see these kind of flashing antennas and go and knock on someone's door and say, you know, what's going on? Can you explain what, what's happening? My name is Joe. So here's an example of it. I know it can never impact me. This is some well, knock knock. Who's that? Chicken. Chicken who? Chicken pox. <laughs> So the, the system was really used for uh, lots of different things. There were people using it to sort of tell, the, te uh, tell each other about the old days. Uh, it was for young people to talk about their, their current um, situation. Uh, it was used like you saw there, uh, kids telling each other knock-knock jokes. Um, uh, somebody actually used it to tell the neighborhood bedtime stories. Um, and really, this is about the community kind of finding its own use for the for the system itself. We then did a different version. We used exactly the same kind of equipment, but we took it to a different community in London, where which was a high rise. And here it was slightly different because it was a very different context. And um, and it was this building uh, was actually largely filled with people who weren't even born in London. And so they had very different experiences that they were bringing to, uh, to the project. And what was interesting was that um, people would talk about things like how they had actually uh, uh, admired their neighbors cooking because they could smell it through the, the corridors, but they'd never actually met them. And so the voiceover project really became a way for them to share their experience of what brought them to London, and what they were doing um, uh, uh, at, at the moment in London, and then, and then sharing those uh, with each other. Uh, we also worked um, in Brighton uh, a, a couple of years later. Actually, we worked with an artist called Emma Franklin, who uh, who's part of the, the, the trans and non-binary community. And she actually took the equipment over and created her own project with that. Um, and it was all about having a, a set of um, performances and experiences through the system. We actually have no documentation of that because effectively it was her project and it was, um, uh, uh, and it was only for the people who were participating in it. But there was one aspect which was public, which was um, at the Marlborough pub, uh, we had this sort of installation on the outside of the pub where every time somebody was talking or contributing something to that network, the LEDs here would fill up and flash with, with, in response to the audio that was being contributed. So people, uh, uh, people could see that something was happening in the network, even if they weren't actually part of that network. So that brings me to the end. Um, uh, and I just want to recap uh, uh, about the, this idea of, of uh, the infrastructures of participation. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm kind of critical of, of the smart city paradigm, but I am kind of interested in this kind of engaging cities paradigm. And the reason that I talk about engaging cities uh, is that actually that is a more useful um, uh, metric, if you like, to, to, to track, which is how many people are actually engaged in and part of decision making in a city. And they fundamentally for me have to be built on this idea of infrastructure of participation. The first being get more people involved in more decisions. Even if they seem trivial or small, the more of those decisions, the better. Uh, the second is getting people to actually kind of experience uh, a shared memory of a possible future. Um, even if they haven't, kind of explicitly created it, they are part of actually 
experiencing it in order to imagine what it might be used for in, uh, in the future. And then the third is actually connecting people together so that they can do stuff together, achieve something together, uh, leading to increased responsibility uh, and impact. And with that, I say thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Usman. Thank you for sharing uh, your project with us. Um, yeah, I, I remember some of the project. You also showed new one that uh, I didn't see in, in the lectures we did before. So it was extremely interesting. Um, I forgot to mention uh, before while we were, um, I was introducing you that um, uh, I actually met Usman around 15 years ago uh, in, in Florence in an event called uh, Festival of Architecture in Video. And uh, Usman was already uh, working on, uh, so it was a, a festival dedicated to architects. I'm an architect too. Uh, Usman is trained as an architect too. So uh, in, in that festival, I already discovered um, uh, some of the directions and uh, themes that Usman is now uh, showing us. And it's incredible how they evolved. Um, uh, so thank you again. Um, I would like now um, to go on with, with the second part of, of this um, talk, where um, our students, a group of our students, uh, would like to interact with, with you, Usman, um, with some questions, sharing their questions and thoughts. We, um, I try to guide them <laughs> um, through your projects. We um, even um, touched other teams that were not uh, uh, specifically presented today by you, but even uh, like privacy. Remember, we talked about privacy uh, um, in, in the last uh, lecture. So uh, today's questions would be, uh, be wider. Um, but um, so because students actually explored uh, from your website uh, all the things you did. So they may, they may even touch uh, other topics. Um, so uh, we have today um, Jan, Omang, uh, Haya, uh, Mia, Nora, Lirica, Veronica, Ilaria, Paola, and Aranzazu, please feel free to uh, start in the order we already discussed about. And uh, let us know what, <laughs> what you would like to ask to Usman. Hello. Ciao. 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 Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, very informative. And um, yeah, you discussed things that uh, maybe surprised us as part of the discussion group. So I'd like to ask you a question that we prepared, but uh, if you're open to it, I would also like to maybe shape the question more towards what you presented to us today. So our question is essentially um, tracking the evolution of behavioral uh, prediction into architecture. Um, how will the spaces of the future be laid out uh, by a data-driven architect who may know us better than we know ourselves. Well, okay, so there's loads to unpack in that question. I think I think it's a, I think it's an interesting question. But first of all, the question I would ask in return almost is how do we want them to? Right? There is no inevitability at all to the future and certainly not to the future of architecture. And I certainly hesitate ever to try and make that kind of prediction that, oh, you know, this is how technology will turn out. And um, Because if, if one thing is clear from technology, you never know. I remember doing projects um, probably around the time that Michele and I first, or, or seeing projects for probably around the time Michele and I first uh, met um, where, like people were barely even like thinking about phones with cameras on them, you know? And it was really like only three years later that suddenly 
this kind of popped up and there was a there was a real different paradigm for how people interact with each other through through their phones that, that kind of hadn't really been fully explored. Um, so the question is, how do we want them to, 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 to manifest themselves, these kind of data-driven algorithms um, and environments that are responding to them? Um, and I would say that, first of all, we definitely don't want them to materialize, I think, in the way that we've seen them materialize online through kind of closed system platforms that are really making massive decisions about how we relate to each other and to, you know, to people that we don't even know on the other side of the world. Um, now, um, one key question I, I would even ask when it comes to kind of prediction and um, any kind of so-called optimization for, for space is to what extent, um, you know, when, when, often when a technology like an optimization algorithm is sold for, for that kind of um, situation, it's presented as, oh, this makes things more efficient or faster or, or what have you. But there is no kind of accounting for the externalities of the consequences on people's just, uh, you know, experience of each other, experience of, of, of agency in a place. And that really does have a cost. So when, when a data-driven algorithm is introduced into an environment and is supposedly predicting what people are doing, let alone whether it's able to predict them or know them, the question really is, what does that even do to the human being in that space, you know? Um, why, why is an efficient response a better one? You know, I think the only people who really think that an efficient space is a better one are the ones who are paying for it. And I don't think that's necessarily um, the, the, the paradigm on which we should base our decisions about the, uh, the, the, the future of our environments, particularly when the thing I hadn't even mentioned in this entire presentation um, uh, you know, the climate crisis, its effect on our environments and our cities is going to be even more massive uh, than, than, than any of the kind of technological infrastructures uh, uh, that we're currently discussing, really. So I don't know if I exactly answered it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that I think there's a very complex set of uh, um, uh, issues behind the question. I, I really appreciate your answer and I agree. I think your background speaks more to the framework rather than the actual structure. Um, so maybe if we have more time, I can ask a follow-up question or Michele, is, do you think it's okay if I ask a short follow-up question? Yeah, of course. It's, it's even better if it's a, a short discussion, so yeah. Okay, yeah, so as you presented in your work, um, what are some co-design methodologies that maybe um, create this sort of inversion of the power dynamic that you were referencing in, in some of the earlier slides? So I think that, that um, it kind of comes down to the decision-making really, like, you know, that whole idea of finding something that somebody else rather than me as the designer makes. And in some projects that, that could be something as trivial as saying somebody else decide the color of something, you know, or somebody else decide the location of something. And there was a time actually that I was a bit, I would feel a bit kind of, um, what's the word, almost like shy to, to sort of present that. Cause it's like, that's a really trivial thing to say that somebody's making a decision on, you know, what color it is, but at scale, when lots of people are doing something and they're able to point to something where they made that decision, what I noticed is that sense of ownership, even if it's only incremental, at scale just means something quite different. And there was a project I didn't talk about um, uh, today, uh, but I think I did last time I spoke to Michele, um, which was called Burble, which was really just, I mean, it was a, an 18 story balloon structure. And it was in one sense, you know, a bit of a, trivial, frivolous kind of thing to do. But the people who had kind of assembled these balloons and kind of decided the, you know, how the colors would move it, you know, 
actually spoke about and even blogged about in one case the project as their project you know it was their thing and i loved the fact that they didn't even mention me or the event or anything like that it was like here's something i did on sunday you know that, that kind of thing um and just one other example was in in voiceover the the last project i showed we had endless debates about the content of the network what what would people talk about and we were constantly trying to say, well, that's really not our decision. That is up to you as the community. But one of the things that was requested by, by the community was, you know, how are we going to censor? No, first of all, the question is, what are we going to censor? Like, how are we going to, like, define the, the, the boundaries of conversation? Um, and we, we more or less said, look, that is for you to decide. And they said, well, how will we do it? So essentially what we did is we did build into the system this kind of big red button where people would take turns to, to, to be in control of the governance of the system. What was so interesting was it was never used. So that aspect of saying, you know what, you're in control, you can stop at any time. You know, it's up to you to develop your own kind of mechanism for deciding when to use it actually meant that they almost like built in their own self self uh, self moderating kind of process if you see it. and that was a really interesting takeaway for me thank you again so much um your work is just so essential i'll hand it off to the next question thank you thank you so much that's, that's very kind words thank you Oman. hi i first want to thank you for such a great presentation um and i think following up from what we were just discussing, I see that your projects, they're connected by the power of individuals to contribute to a larger whole. But in societies, there's civil, um, civilians that are more active and some that are more passive. And you're all about creating engaging cities. So how do you approach engaging those who are more passive when you're trying to inspire this action and change? So one of the things I, I like to think about is what I call the granularity of, of the participation, which essentially means that there's like lots of different resolutions of people's engagement. You know, so there are people who might get involved very deeply in something maybe even quite technical, or there might be people who be people who are only involved in, as I was mentioning a second ago, in deciding a color. You know, or there might be people who have actually opted out of the system entirely and said, I don't want to be part of this. Now, for me, all of those need to be reflected in the, in the final thing. So first of all, I try not to just make it about people who have opted in. I would, you know, if, if I'm, I'm trying to think of an example here, um, I can't quite off the top of my head, but I'm, I, I would always try and reflect somehow those who've decided not to be part of it in the same, in some sense, alongside people who've decided to be part of it. And then, you know, provide these sort of different, again, often trying to do this actually in conjunction with the, the, the group I'm working with to understand even where those different strata are. But, you know, so that it, uh, an example is uh, Another Life, another project I didn't talk about today, but it's, um, it's an interactive public space in, in Bradford. Now, you know, there are things like, you know, you can just go and walk through the square and have no idea you're even doing anything, but actually you're having this kind of rippling effect on the interactive systems uh, that, that are kind of going out for me and this kind of lasers and lights and fountains and mist machines and so on and so forth. But you could also get involved at a, at a deeply technical level and actually rewrite configuration code that actually re-scripts what the interaction actually is. And there's lots of kind of things in between. So, so that, that, that's one thing um, trying to do. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Hi. Try. Hi. Uh, thank you first very much for your uh, intervention. It was really interesting. I wanted uh, to ask uh, if you have ever worked uh, on uh, any project about uh, safety and uh, if uh, and uh, if you had to use data or uh, participation in a project uh, 
about the women's safety in cities, how would you use it? Uh, as I have come across uh, many projects in my personal experience uh, that uh, were very appreciated as a concept, but uh, didn't really meet uh, the interest of the users uh, at the end. So that's the question. Thank you. Um, so actually, I would, uh, I, I would direct you to the work of Ling, uh, Ling Tan, who is, she's actually part of Umbrellium. And her website is lingql.com. And uh, she actually usually does a lot of our kind of wearables and, um, and the kind of community activation stuff and air quality projects and so on and so forth. Now, her, her recent work actually has been specifically on the topic of perceptions of safety, particularly for women in cities, and how to map and even compare very different uh, perceptions of safety. It was a project that actually started in South Africa uh, and she's now looking at it in different um, uh, cities and, and part of, I don't really want to talk for her work too much, but essentially she's looking at how people can create their own apparatus for m measuring their own perception of safety and then compare it with each other and understand just how different those maps actually are. Um, so yeah, so I, I, that, that, that's probably a much better thing to look at than anything I could uh, say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guzman. Yes, I just checked on uh, Ilaria. Yeah, the, on, on Umbrellium website, uh, you can find all the links uh, for LinkedIn projects and LinkedIn and so on. So yeah, thank you, Guzman, for the suggestion. We are moving on now. So, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Usman, again for the presentation. So very high quality content. Uh, so my questions is related to your work. So uh, as you were to reimagine cities as a better place for all, uh, I was wondering, like, what is your idea of utopia? There's again a lot to unpack in that. I actually I I don't believe in utopia, um, or I'm not that interested in utopia in the sense that I am interested mostly and, and so there there's perhaps something that comes through in some of the things I've talked about, which is that as a designer, I'm actually not very confident that I know what the future should be. I'm actually quite unconfident that I have any answer to, to, to what it should be. And in, in a sense, you could read almost every project that I've done as me basically saying, I have no idea. Let me make it easier for everyone else to figure it out, you know? Um, so I tend to, to really not have uh, an answer for that in, in and of itself. That's, that's sort of one answer. I mean, the second side of the answer is that the work that I'm actually starting to do now, uh, and I have been on the lot in the last year, I really didn't talk very much about it uh, today because it's, it's a kind of, it's part of a 10 year um, uh, program. And, um, uh, and it's really just in, in, in the first year. So I barely even understand really what I'm working on, but it is essentially, it is, a, uh, it is about the conjunction of human, urban, and natural systems. And for me, if there's anything approaching a slightly more ideal situation, and I, I'm not gonna use the word utopia necessarily, but a, a sort of a thing to move towards, it's one where natural systems are an intimate part of the urban environment and not just, oh, let's have some urban agriculture and, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a wild meadow and, you know, wouldn't it be good to have sort of um, some animals roaming around? It's actually re-scripting everything we do in terms of our relationship to natural systems. So pollinators, um, you know, uh, the mice that live in our house, you know, um, uh, insects, the biomass of amphibians in our cities, birds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I don't know what that looks like, but that's kind of what I'm, that, that's kind of what I'm 
working on now. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Hello. Um, the next question we want to ask is actually um, related to the power you were talking about, um, because like nowadays, the, a lot of smart device is actually um, based on data analyze. So our question will be, um, how do you think about data information? Like who owns those information that people um, generate in a smart city? Uh, I don't have a great answer. I, I, I realize I keep saying I don't have quite the answer uh, you might be looking for here. So, so I apologize in advance. But I, what I was going to say is that I, I feel like three years ago, I could have answered that question. And I, and I could have thought that I knew the answer to that question. Now, I just don't. You know, in the context of things like NFTs, in the context of, you know, massive data breaches, in the context of the absolute you know, uh, dichotomy of the power dynamic of platforms like Facebook and the media in really structuring not just the conversations we're, we're having, but the decisions we're making about that as a consequence. This question of data and ownership is, it's, it's, a, it's a massive one. Um, I, I would, I, I, again, if I could recommend someone's work to look at in this regard, Kate Crawford, uh, has a new book just about to come out. Um, I haven't read it, but I'm uh, but I love her work, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great one. It's called AI the AI uh, AI something. Sorry, I'm blanking again. Um, but I'm really excited uh, for that book, and I think I think it would have some answers to, to that question. Okay, thank you. We will check. We will look into it. Thank you, Mia. And thank you, Usman. Um, I think we reached the end of our session. Uh, so yeah, I would like to uh, thank you again. Uh, also, my colleagues from the uh, from the other masters, uh, the students are attending because they are students from uh, interior and living design, product design, urban vision, architecture design, visual brand design, business design. <laughs> interaction design and service design and we thought that all these disciplines actually can uh, can be connected to your work so uh, the other amazing thing is that what we've seen crosses so many disciplines that um, and is very interesting for uh, for uh, many of our programs um, so uh, thank you, Usman. Uh, thank you for your time. It was uh, great. Thank you for uh, for everybody uh, to attend this this talk. I, I look forward into having you again in the next future, hopefully in person one day. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And and really, I I really appreciate those those questions. It's not often that one gets really meaty questions, and I and I, I hope I was able to at least contribute some response. Um, but uh, no, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Usman. See you soon. Bye. Ciao, tutti. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye